started. Today we are going to finish, um, no, I, I don't think we can finish chapter 9, but uh, let me just talk about the quiz we had uh, last class. So basically we talked about four things. So based on the description, what is the population? Population is a group of people or individuals that we want to study. Why do we want to uh, collect data? Why do we want to sample some people? That's because I want, we want to study a group of people. So in this case, the group of people we want to study is from a second sentence, visit the travelers in the US. Or if you enter first class passenger sentence or the fine. So that's the group of people we want to study. Then what is the value we want? So that's going to be the second one, the population parameter. The population parameter could be two things. One is mean, some mean value or average. The other is the percentage or proportion. So if we go back to this question, so the way to determine the percentage is also in the second sentence. The percentage of within the travelers in the US that believe the food quality has not improved. So that percentage is the parameter or the population parameter we want. So that's a that's the answer to the second question. The third one is questions. What is the sampling frame? The sampling frame is the list of the individuals or the people we wanna collect the sample from. So in this question, they have uh, an alphabet alphabetized list of the airlines, frequent flyers, clubs. So that's the sampling frame. They collect sample from that list. Then the fourth one, sampling method. They have uh, they use technology to generate a randomly shuffled list of members. Then they collect some of the members. So that's a simple random sample. In this question, let's be clear about the first two terms. Population is the group of people we want to study, and the number we want is is called population primary. Could be, it could be mean, could be proportion or percentage. So that's the that's the uh, quiz we have uh, last time. So any questions on the quiz? So before we start chapter nine, uh, so there are a few things I want to mention. I'm not sure if uh, everyone knows that. So in on Blaze View, under each chapter, I uploaded several videos for assignment question. So if you work on, uh, say right now, uh, I think next week, chapter seven assignment will be due. So I uploaded a few videos. The videos do not cover all the questions, but they do cover some of the questions. So if you have questions, uh, you can go to Blaze View to see if I have a video for that question or not. If not, uh, you can. Uh, send me email, say, hey, uh, could you make a video to work on question number, say, question number two, or question number two. So I will be happy to do that. I will share the video on, on Facebook. Okay. So what you need to do is, uh, is to just uh, let me know which question uh, you want me to talk about. Okay. So that's uh, one more thing before we go back to chapter nine. Chapter nine, with, in chapter nine, we will talk about two things. One is sampling distribution. We have started uh, we have started sampling distribution last class. The other one is confidence interval or interval estimation. So the sampling distribution is we know what's going on in the population. So right now, since we finished chapter eight, we need to deal with two things. One is the population, the other is the sample. Population is a real group of people, individuals we are not studying, but we don't have access to everyone, so we collect a sample from them. So if we study the sample distribution, we know the population parameter. So the parameter can be a proportional percentage or a mean. So let's talk about, we will talk about both, but let's talk about the proportion first. We, if we collect a sample, every time we collect a sample, we calculate the, the value, which is called sample statistic. Here we're talking about proportion. 
the proportion, 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 proportion. No, those are sample proportions. And we notice that whenever we collect a random sample, we have a different sample proportion. So 0 0.22, 0 0.19, 0 0.25, 0 0.20. Eight and so forth. So which makes this sample proportion or the sample statistic a random variable. So if we collect a lot of samples and we put those sample statistics in the histogram, this is what we get. And we notice that it's kind of a normally distributed. So that means the p hat, the, the p hat the sample statistic follows a normal distribution. Then if we talk about normal distribution, we need two, two numbers. One is the mean of the distribution, the other is the standard deviation of the distribution. So what I want to put here is, so we know that we are dealing with putting population. So for the population, we know the population parameter p in this case is 0.21, and now we want to study our sample. We want to study our sample proportion or sample statistic in general terms. We know that this guy follows a normal distribution. So normal distribution has to have a mean, and it has to have a standard deviation. Then what's the mean? What's the standard deviation? Then the mean is the mean is p. So this one should be given to us because we, we, we assume that we know the population problem. So the mean is the population proportion p, and the standard deviation is square root of p times one minus p, which is q over the sample size. P times 1 minus p over the sample size. So p, we, we already know p and n, the sample size, because we have the sample, we should know our sample size. Then we should be able to get the mean, get the standard deviation, then this thing would be the distribution of our p hat, or p, uh, the sample statistic, or sample proportion, uh, particularly in this case. So that's what we covered last class. That's how do we implement this one. So let's see one exercise. So in this exercise, we know the population. The population is the national-wide data. So national-wide, a bank believes that 9% of the customers will not make timely payments. On, on, their, on their loan. So that's national wide. So that's population. They're talking about population. They know the population parameter. So let me update the value here. So they believe national wide for the population, 9%, yes, 9% or uh, 0.09. 9% of people will not make timely payments if you use money for them. <coughs> then they want to study the sample. Uh, the bank has recently approved 600 loans. So the sample size here, so the sample size n is equal to 600. They want, want to study, they want to assess, access, uh, uh, they want to evaluate the risk of those 600 customers. Before they do this analysis, they have to know, okay, what is the distribution for this proportion? So the question is, uh, what are the mean and standard deviation of the proportion of clients uh, in those 600 customers who may not make timely payments? So this proportion, this percentage follows a normal distribution. That's what we discussed in the previous slide. It has a mean and standard deviation. Fortunately, we can calculate those things. So the mean is just population proportion. So the mean is equal to p, which is 9% or 0.09. So the mean is the, is the 
चाहिए दी हुआ है Now we have the mean, we have the standard deviation. We know the distribution of the central proportion. So that's that's the first step. So any any question on on the calculate the mean standard deviation? The next question. Then they want to evaluate. What's the problem that uh, there will be more than 11% of the customers who will not make timely payment? So among the 600 customers, what's the problem that more than 11% of them will not make timely payment? So we, from the first question, we already have the distribution. So for this question, what we want to do is This is what we want to do. We want to know what the property that the proportion of the customers who do not make timely payments is is greater than 2011. Basically, this is the translation of the Well, the problem that the proportion of customers who do not make happy payment is more than 0.11%. Sorry, 11% 11 or 0.11. So that's the mean. So we want to know what the problem that Has follows the normal distribution. We have the mean, we have the deviation. Do you want to use next one or do you want to use that? Okay. Most people want to use that one. But remember, after you finish class, you probably you will uh, use Excel. Okay. In addition to in addition to knowing how to do the calculation in that one, please spend some time to learn how to uh, use Excel. But right now, as you decide that you. Or that's one thing I want to mention. So probably many of you have noticed in chapter six, chapter seven, there are some questions that do not have link to that. And there will be a few questions in the exam that do not have a link to that. So I would suggest before you work on the assignment, before you take the exam, so in this math, let's not let's open the second. Every time you work on something, please uh, 
open the tech one first. So then in the main page, we have a bunch of options that Keep it open, okay? Let's keep it open. Because if you close this, if you have some some question that do not have the link, if you go back go back there, the the, the assignment window will be closed. I, I don't know why they designed it like that, but let's keep it open the whole time. Then let's use the normal calculator set calculator. So let's put in the, we need two parameters. So mean is uh, there, the point, your line, the elevation is point zero one one seven. And the probability we want to calculate is, what the probability that the random variable is greater than, greater than point eleven. Are you clearly confused? <laughs> That's the probability. Yeah. Point zero four three seven. If you wanna keep for that interest. So I know in the uh, assignment question in chapter seven, if you check the, uh, I think there's option called new example. So if so, the example is so normal distribution uh, uh, require you to copy the z score. And then based on the z-score to do the rest of the calculation, you don't have to follow that direction. For normal distribution, if you want to calculate the probability from normal distribution, you just use this, this step bounce or using the example. You don't have to calculate the z-score. So if you want to manually do the calculation, you, you have to you can calculate the z-score. But we have step bounce, we have Excel. So you don't have to go through the whole process. But this is the answer to the second. chance that or over 11 percent of those 600 customers will not make time payment so we just with so basically just this question so any questions on the second one Because in the previous class, uh, the Excel does not have the function to directly calculate the probability that the random, random variable is greater than a value. It can only calculate the probability that the random variable is less than a value. So in order to calculate, this is what we want to calculate. So let's, let me just duplicate it. So let me use this x to replace uh, the, the p hat. So this is what we want, but we have to manipulate this one a little bit. So to 
might not have to do much. So any questions? <coughs> so that's question number two. Uh, let's do one more similar practice. But the second question will be different. So the question is, uh, the description is the proportion of adult women in a certain area is about 49% of market group one group of survey, and they call nine, uh, 600 people at random. And what was the elevation of the proportion of people who they call are women? So we are, we are still talking about the proportion. But the difference is just we have different data. Number. Let me keep the publication. So in this way, in, in this question, uh, the population proportion is that forty nine percent. So forty nine percent of people are women. So that's uh, four point forty seven. I'm uh, sorry, forty nine. Sample size still they called six hundred people. So they still six hundred. Uh, mean is the population proportion is 0.49 and standard deviation we just need to plus that one. Let me do it very quick. So 0.49 times 1 minus 0.49 over 600. We got the mean, we got the standard deviation. So we are good for the first part. But the real question is the second one. Would you be surprised to find, after you call those 600 people, would you be surprised to find half of the people you called are women? So would you be surprised? found out, okay, half of the people I called are women. So the question, the, before we answer this question, we have to define something. What is called surprise? So what number, what number do you see you will feel surprised? Because we know that, that the sample proportion follows a normal distribution. So when we, were, when we were talking about the normal distribution in chapter seven, we have a rule which involves three numbers. So the first number is 68. We have one number in the middle, and the one is 99.7. Do you guys still remember this rule? 95. The middle number is 95. So that means 90, uh, 68%, 95%, what does this mean? That means 68%, if we are talking about normal distribution, 68% of the data will be within one standard deviation of the mean. That means 68% will be between one standard deviation minus Sorry, mean what minus one standard deviation and mean plus one standard deviation. So 68% of data will be in this interval. And 95 means 95% of data will fall between mean minus two standard deviations and mean plus two standard deviations. So that's a two standard deviations and third one is three standard deviations. When do we call it a uh, surprise? If the sample statistic is outside of two standard deviations of the mean, we call it surprise. So two standard
standard deviations, that's a magic number we need to use. So we have to check if 50% is outside of this interval or is inside of this interval. If it's inside this interval, it's not a surprise. If it's outside of the interval, it would be a surprise. Okay. But in order to check that, we have to see what is the lower limit. We have to construct this interval. What is the lower limit? What is the upper limit? So the lower limit is the mean minus, the lower limit is mean minus the one, sorry, two standard deviations. The upper limit is mean plus two standard deviations. So we just plug the number in here. So the mean is 0.49 minus 2 times, here's the standard deviation, 204, the result is uh, 0.4592. If you have calculator, please help, help me. Plus 0.0408. So the result is uh, 0.5308. Okay. So we got the lower limit, <coughs> mean minus two standard deviations, and we got the upper limit. Point Five three zero eight. Then we need to check if fifty percent is within the interval or outside the interval. And very obvious is in the interval. It's not obvious at all. It's not. A, it's not a surprise because it's within two standard deviations of the mean. So we are kind of expecting to see fifty percent of the people who talk are women. So remember two standard deviations. So that's the match number we need to use. Outside of the two standard deviations, surprise. Within two standard deviations, not surprise. So that's the second question. Any question? So as long as we are talking about a normal distribution, so it's always true that one than sixty-eight percent of the data will be within one standard deviation. Ninety-five percent will be in two standard deviations, and ninety-nine point seven percent will be in three standard deviations. It's always true, but. Regarding the threshold, it really depends on the mean and standard deviation. So if you have different mean, different standard deviations, you will have different the the the, the value. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that but if we just talk about the mean plus minus standard deviation, it's all over. Any other question? So that's fifty percent. One more number, thirty-six percent. So 36% is even low, it's even smaller than the lower limit. So it's outside of the it's outside of the interval. So we will be surprised to see only 36 of 36 percent of the people you called are women. It's really low because that means 95% of the data should be within here. But you get a number that is far away lower, far away from the lower limit. That means, we, that means if we only have very, very small probability to see 36%. But if, we, if you did see 36%, that, that would be a so remember, two standard deviations, so that's a magic number.
Okay, we are done with the proportion. So, so far, all the discussion we have, sample distribution is about proportion. If the population uh, primary is the proportion. Then as we said, proportion is one type of parameter. The other type of parameter is mean. So now, now let's work on the mean. So the underlying logic is the same, but the formulation is a little bit different. So if the population in population primary is a mean and we collect sample, the sample statistic is called sample mean. So now we use the y hat, the sorry, y bar. The y bar. We use y bar to denote the sample mean. So sample mean in this case is our sample statistic. <coughs> And the sample statistic is a random variable. So here, let me get rid of all those things. Uh, mean, uh, we, have, we have different, different equations. So the population parameter, we have there are two parameters we need. So one is the population mean. So why is population mean? Mu, we like a mu. The other is the population standard deviation theta. We assume that we know those two numbers. Those two numbers are given to us. Then let's talk about the distribution of the sample statistics statistic that we have. So the sample statistic here is y bar. So sample mean. Fortunately, sample mean also follows a normal distribution with a mean and standard deviation. So we using we will be using the same method to get the mean and standard deviation. So the mean is equal to the population mean. So no population is needed. Get the population mean there. So the mean is just population mean. Standard deviation, we have to do a little bit of calculation, but it's not that complicated. So it's equal to population standard deviation over the square root of your sample size. Standard deviation or uh, the population standard deviation is given to us because we are. We assume that we know the, we know those two parameters. Sample size, that's your sample. You should know how many individuals are there in your sample. So this is also known to us. So the rest of the job is just to plug numbers in there. Then we'll get the mean, we get the standard deviation. So that's the distribution of your y bar or sample mean or sample statistics. So any questions on this one? So what if we do not have this one? What if we do not have the population standard deviation? No worries. Let's use our sample standard deviation, small s. So if this one is not available to us, let's use the small s. Let's use the sample standard deviation. Because we, we have samples. So if we get a list of data or a column of data in the Excel, we can calculate the average, we can calculate the standard deviation. And that standard deviation is the small s. Then let's use the small s to replace the population standard deviation. So if we do have the population standard deviation, let's use the population standard deviation. But if we do not have this, let's use the sample standard deviation. So those are the two possible uh, cases. But still, the mean is just the population mean. We have to have the mean. At least, you have to tell, tell me something about the population. Otherwise, I, I cannot study myself. So this is a, it's a must. We must know this. Population standard deviation, if you give me 
that, I, I will be happy, but if you do not give me that, I can handle that by myself. So those are the two things, um, two form formula we, we can use. So any questions? Okay, here is how it works. So just like the, the very first slide we had about the proportion, so this is the population we have. So this is the population, the di distribution of the population. Of course, this is not a normal distribution. It's skewed, skewed to the, to the right. Then we start to collect samples, collect a lot of samples. Then it asks, every time we have a sample, we calculate what is the sample mean, what is the sample standard deviation, we do it over and over and over again, assuming we have 1,000 or 2,000 samples. Then we put all the sample means together in this histogram. And then we find out, find out, okay, it also follows a normal distribution. It's kind of unimodal, bell-shaped, symmetric. So that's a normal model. And then if we plot it, it will be like this. So normal distribution. So that's why we can do this kind of it's based on our experience. It's based on our empirical study. <coughs> right? If we do this over and over again and put all the means together, that's, that's, we will get a normal shape. So that's, that's a similar story uh, here. So let's see one assignment question. So question number eight in your chapter nine assignment. I'll, I'll keep this deck one open. I will not close it. Question number eight. Uh, okay. According to a recent study. 26% of people in a certain area have high level of bad coding. Uh, they report that such uh, level, uh, I don't think the second sentence uh, is visible for us. Okay, let's see. That's the third one. According to recent studies, the cholesterol levels in healthy adults uh, from that area average about 209, and standard deviation is 30. Are the level the levels are roughly normally distributed. So if the cholesterol levels of a sample of so they collected a sample with sample size of forty six healthy adults from that region, uh, we got a couple of questions. So the first question is, what shape will the sampling distribution of the mean? Let me say say. It's like uh, the sample mean. What's the sampling distribution of the sample mean have? It's going to be normal. So that's what we learned. So it's going to be a no, it's not really normally distributed. So then what is the mean of the sampling distribution? So what is the mean of the sampling distribution? So it's equal to the population mean, but what is the population mean? So if you read the question there, there are three numbers. So that's why I, I picked this 
there's a question. So there are three numbers, 26%, 209, and 30. Which one is the population mean? So we are talking about the mean value or average. Two nine. So two nine two zero nine is our population mean. What about the standard deviation? So we get thirty. So we have the population uh, mean. We have the population standard deviation. Then, so the mean is the standard, the mean of the standard distribution is just the population mean. So it's mu which is 209, so this is need to put 209. Then standard deviation. Now the standard deviation is equal to the population standard deviation over square root of n. What is n here? We need n here. 46. So our job is to just plug the numbers in there. So Sigma over square root of n. If you plug numbers in there, the sigma is 30 over square root of 46. We need to do the calculation. Let me do it in detail. It's equal to. So for part B and part C, we just we just follow this this part. B. Mean is the population mean. Standard deviation is the population standard deviation over square root of the n. If the sample size were increased to 90, how would your, how would your, uh, your answer to those part change? For part A, what, is the, what would be the shape of the distribution if we increase the sample size to 90? Still normally distributed or it's going to be changed? <coughs> We had 46 at the beginning. Now we had 90. The shape will not change if we increase the sample size. Since the population mean is normally distributed, and if we increase the sample size, the shape of the distribution of your sample proportion, the y bar is still normally distributed. Okay. So if the shape doesn't change, we still have the same mean. We know we still have the, the same shape, normal distribution. But what about the parameter? We have do we have a different mean? Or it's going to be changed? What would happen to, to this one? We know the mean of the sample distribution is equal to the population mean. In this case, if we increase the sample size, does that change the population mean? It's still the population mean. The population mean is still there. It's still 209. It doesn't matter you have 46 in your sample, you have 90 in your sample, or you have 900 in your sample. The population mean is still 209. It doesn't change. So the, the mean of the uh, sample distribution is still.
Then what about the sample standard deviation? Well, what about this one? Coefficient or root? So the standard deviation is in this format. Sigma, the population standard deviation is it's a population parameter, it's not coefficient. But it depends on the sample size. So we got new sample size, so we have to redo the calculation. It will be changed. So what is the new one? Look at this. So the new sample size is nine. So then let's be careful about uh, the, the part D. Because it's, uh, the question says the population follows a normal distribution. Increasing the sample, in this case, increasing the sample size or decreasing the sample size does not change the thing, does not change the shape of the sampling distribution. But if we do not have that assumption normally distributed for the population, we have to be careful. So, so we will talk about that uh, in the later slides when we talk about the condition. So any questions on this, on any of the part before we go move forward? <coughs> Why can we assume the sample statistic follows a normal distribution? That's totally because of this theory, central limit theory. So the sampling distribution model of sample mean or sample proportion from a random sample will be following a normal distribution as long as the sample size n is large enough and the observations are independent. When you collect samples, the samples are independent. So as long as you have a large sample size and the observations are independent, you can assume that your sample statistic, no matter you have the proportion or mean, so they, both of them will follow a normal distribution. So <coughs> that's the central limit theory. So if we do not have this central limit theory, we don't have we we don't have any of the discussion we have. So that's the theory we had behind all of our discussion. So how, how do we know if we can use central limit theory or not? So there are two assumptions according to the definition. One is that the sample size has to be large enough. But how large is called large? So the other one is the observation has to be independent. So we have to satisfy those two conditions. So the two assumptions. So in order to meet those two assumptions, usually we check three conditions. The, third, the, the first condition is called randomization condition. So you have to collect random samples. You have to collect random samples. You have a list, you randomly select some, some people. You're not only selecting the top four, or top five, top 10, you're not gonna reduce that. That's the first condition. The second condition, 10% condition. You have to make sure that your sample size cannot be larger than 10% of your population size. Otherwise, your observations will not be independent. So 10% 10 condition means the sample size, the 
sample is a large uh, fraction of the population, then the independent uh, assumption won't be satisfied. So it cannot be greater than 10% of your population size. Normally, we should be okay with the 10% of the patients because the most, most of our application are uh, collecting sample from our uh, customers. We want to study our customers. Are you satisfied with our product or are you satisfied with uh, my service? Then what is the population size of our customers? Anyone can be our customer, right? So our population size, normally we have <coughs> infinite population if we talk about customer. So anyone can be our customer, potential our customer. So we should be good uh, with the second condition. The third one, if we talk about sample proportion, we have to meet the third condition, success and failure condition. The both number of successes and the number of failures have to be at least ten. In other words, n times p and n times one minus p, both values have to be at least ten. So let's say, let's use the, uh, the proportion we had on the first slide. So the proportion, population proportion is 21% over 0.21. Then I want to study my sample. I have to make sure that uh, my sample size is large enough so that I can do, do uh, central limit theory. Then I said, okay, let me have Ten people in my sample. So if P is equal to uh, 0.21, then Q or uh, one minus P is uh, one minus 0.21, which is 0.99. So if my sample size is 10, let me check the condition. So n times P would be 10 times 0.21, which is 2.1, and which is less than 10. In this case, uh, the last condition is not met. That means if I had <coughs> people in my sample, I cannot use central limit, central limit theory to study my sample statistics. So this guy does not follow, does not follow normal distribution. What if I have 100? One n times p, so that's only greater than ten. So if I calculate n times q or one or n times one minus p, so that's only one hundred times point nine, which is ninety nine, which is also greater than ten. So we should be we should be good. So that's why the central limit theory is that we have to have a large enough sample. So how large is large enough? It should be large enough so that both numbers are at least 10. If we talk about the proportion. But normally, uh, but in real practice, sometimes we do not know. It's really hard to get this proportion. So the rule of thumb is to have at least 30 individuals in your sample. So if you have 30 individuals in your sample, you should be good enough to use central limit theory for any distribution for the population. But if you know your population is normally distributed, it doesn't matter the sample size. You can directly use central limit theory. But if we talk about the, the proportion, those are the, those are the three conditions that we have to check. Regarding the central limit theory, one thing I would like to mention is that um, the central limit theory is about the sample statistic. 
sum of proportion or sum of mean is not about the population. Some, sometimes people may say, okay, data are normally distributed as long as the sample size is large enough. That's a wrong uh, statement about attribution theory. How many, your sample size does not uh, impact the distribution of your population. It doesn't matter you, you, if you have 10 or 1,000 in your sample. If the population is normally distributed, it's still normally distributed. If, we, if it's exponential, it follows exponential distribution, it still, it still follows exponential distribution. It doesn't matter how, much, how many uh, individuals you have in your sample. So let's be clear about potential theory. It's about sample statistics, not about population. So we're done with sampling distribution. So half of the chapter is done. Okay? We already covered half of the chapter. So sampling distribution is that we know what's going on in the population. We want to study our sample. So that's what we discussed. The next one we want to cover is called constant interval, or sometimes it's called interval estimation. So constant interval is that we do not know our population. We hope to study our population parameter. So how do we do that? We collect sample, we calculate the sample statistic, we try to use the sample statistic or the information from the sample to estimate the population parameter. So normally, the second one, <coughs> this is the direction we uh, usually take. We use samples to study the population. So that's why we want to uh, spend more time in this constant interval. So let me get rid of some uh, solutions. So let's be clear about the direction. So sampling distribution is is to use population information to study the sample. And the constant interval is to use sample information to study the population. So before we go there, um, so for constant interval, we also have two applications. One is a proportion. For example, if we want to study the population proportion. The other is population mean. We want to study the population mean for an average household income. So that's what we want to do. So how do we use sample data to estimate the population parameter? For example, we want to uh, study the population proportion. So I want to know if in the next presidential election candidate if candidate A will have more than 51% of support. I want to know that. This, this would be a population proportion. That's the population parameter we want to estimate. So how do we study that? In fact, sample, we ask people, do you support A or candidate B? Then we collect a lot of data. So the day after we calculate, again, the data we calculate from within our sample. What is the percent, what we, what is the percentage of the people who support the candidate name? And we try to use this number to estimate this population proportion. So before we take this class, maybe um, some of you may think, so if, if this is uh, 52, this would be 52. But, we, but in statistics, we cannot say that. We cannot give a single number to the population parameter. So instead, we give an interval. So that's called constant interval. We use this information or other information in the sample to 
construct an interval such that this interval may capture this population parameter. In other words, we may think, okay, the population parameter is somewhere there. But where exactly? I don't know, but I, I know it's somewhere there. So that this is the best we can do if we use sample data to estimate the, to the population parameter. If you can study all the people in your population, we can do this. But in 99.999999% of applications, we cannot do that because we do not survey or sample all the people in the population. And this is what we can do. We think of constant interval. So this is an interval. This is called constant interval. So in order to construct this interval, we need a few things. So we need to know the center. Where is the center of the interval? So this is one question mark. After we have this center, what is the length of this? What is the length of this one? What is the length of this one? So that we can have this lower limit and this upper limit. So how do we define interval? Just two numbers, lower limit and upper limit. If you have those two, you have interval. So those are the numbers that we are looking for. So in order to get those numbers, we need to find the, the middle, this side first, then calculate what is this one, what is this one. Then we have this group. Okay. So that's our uh, job today. Uh, so one component that we need to get those two numbers is called standard error. So standard error, so right now we are talking about proportion. So let's talk about proportion first, then mean later. So for the proportion, uh, the samples, uh, the standard error SE is equal to square root of P hat times one minus P hat or Q hat over the sample size. So if you look at the expression, it's quite similar. It's quite similar. We have this similar expression square root of the p times 1 minus p over n in the sampling distribution. But that is for the sampling distribution using the population proportion. But right now, we, don't, we know nothing about population. We only know about the sample proportion, the p hat. We only know this one. So let's give us the standard error. So what we need to know is the expression of standard error. So we need to, uh, right there. So we need to know this one. Let's remember the expression for the standard error. So at, at least you, you need to know where to find it. At, at least you need to know there's something called standard error. So any questions on this slide? So if we plot numbers in there, probably that, that's what we need to do. Any question? So that's the definition of constant interval. Um, I kind of explained that so we don't have to uh, spend time here. So there's one condition. So every time we implement some theory, there are a lot of these requirements. So independent assumption, that's something we talked about when we when we were talking about the uh, central limit theory. So we have to check two conditions, randomization condition, we randomly select our sample, okay? We can do that. 10% condition, the sample size cannot be greater than 10% of the population, okay. No problem. So those are not new requirements. So after we get rid of all those assumptions, that we satisfy all the conditions, then let's talk about how to get this interval done. Where is the center? Where is the center? The center is called estimate. So this question mark, so this question mark, the, the middle point is called estimate. So that's a new term, but, but this is 
just the sample for um, sample for or sample statistics. Let me use sample statistics because we we dealing with the mean. So the middle point we call estimate is the sample statistic. So this is the value you can get from your sample. So you have a list of people candidate A, B, A, 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 B, A, B, 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 B. then you calculate, okay? 52% people I sampled support candidate A. So P hat is equal to 52% and the estimate is 52%. So if we just give a different name. Yes. So that's the center. Then what is a lot of this one and this one? So this part is called margin of error. So if you use estimate, if you use estimate or the sample that is minus a margin of error, you will get a lower mean. Estimate plus a margin of error, you will get an upper mean. So what is the margin of error? So margin of error has two things. One is the Z, we call it critical value. The other term is the one we just mentioned in the previous slide, standard error. So that means margin of error is equal to critical value times standard error. So standard error, we already discussed standard error. So it's square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. So all the values are from our sample. So we have no trouble getting number for standard error. But what about z? What is z? So when did we use z? So z is a random error. <coughs> so if you have worked on the work on the chapter seven assignment, we know z follows a standard normal distribution. So z follows a standard normal distribution. But how do we get this value? How do we get the z? Here I had two, but should I get one? Should I get 2.2? So how do we determine the z? So z value or the critical value is based on your confidence level. So how confident are we about having this interval capture the true population parameter. Of course, we want to be 100% first. In theory, that, that, that's impossible. So maybe I want to, okay, at least I want to be 95% confident that my confidence interval can capture the population parameter, or 99% confident that my interval will capture this. Uh, True population parameter. Then we need to use your confidence level. Say so you want to be 90% confident that your interval will capture the true population parameter. Then you put this 90% into a standard normal distribution. So you put the 90% into the standard normal distribution. You know that the, the middle part, the shaded area is 90%. Then the z value, the critical value is this one. Is this one. So this the z value and the negative z will define your 90% in a standard normal curve. In other words, you need to find value such that the value itself and the negative value together will define 90% in a standard normal curve. So for a standard normal distribution, we already know the mean and standard deviation. So the mean is zero, standard deviation is one. So all we need to do is to find which is this value. 
such that the middle part is 90%. So if you want to be 90% confident, this is the value you want to find. If you want to, if you say, okay, I want 90% is not good enough, I want to be 95%, then you have to enlarge that area to cover 95%. And this is the value you're gonna find. This is gonna be the, the B value. So, <coughs> how do we find this B value? Although we theoretically we know what B value is, but in practice, how do we find this, this value? Maybe using uh, Excel or Blackboard. How do we do that? So let's discuss that uh, next class. So we don't have enough time today. So we will stop here and we will uh, meet, a, meet again on Friday. So we have the road today. If you are late, please come here to sign.